Hello, welcome to Legendary Adventures of Legend of Zelda podcast. This week we explore the third dungeon of the Legend of Zelda, level 3, the Manji. I'm your host, Paul Riley, and I'm a Zelda fan, exploring the evolution of the series by playing through each mainline Zelda game in release order. That means I'm excluding spin-offs and multiplayer-focused releases. Now, before we get into the dungeon itself, we have to address the shape of the Manji. You can see it on page 34 of the manual. I've also posted a map that shows the shape on my social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. You can just search Legendary Adventures Podcast. It's a cross shape with hooked arms. The top arm faces to the left. Most Westingers would confuse this symbol with a Nazi swastika. In Japan, however, this symbol is called the manji. The manji predates the Nazi swastika by hundreds of years, and it has a different meaning. First, you'll notice the orientation of the manji. It's a mirror image of the other symbol. And yes, that orientation matters. To use an imperfect analogy, compare it to the lowercase b and the lowercase d in the Romanized alphabet. The letters are practically mirror images of each other, and an early learner of the alphabet will get them confused, but the letters are distinct and they carry different meanings. There are a number of cultures across the world that use the swastika and similar symbols like the manji, and they've used it for hundreds of years prior to its use in Nazi Germany. Some of those cultures continue to use the symbol today, although there is friction when they interact with others outside their culture. A BBC article entitled The Ancient Symbol That Was Hijacked by Evil by Kalpanda Sunder details the complex history of the symbol and it discusses the ongoing friction in its use. Sunder explains that in Japanese culture, the manji represents the footsteps of Buddha. However, it's clear that people in Japan are aware of how this symbol is interpreted by those unfamiliar with their culture. In the article, Sunder notes that ahead of the 2021 Olympics, Japan decided to drop the symbol from tourist maps it was used to mark temples they was replaced with a pagoda icon. The article noted that this provoked backlash within Japan, but it concludes when the elements of a culture are adopted out of context, it seems its history and heritage become tainted. I was unable to find any commentary on the shape of this dungeon that was contemporary to the game's release, but I imagine that Nintendo did receive some comments about it. It also seems clear that Nintendo wanted to sell games like The Legend of Zelda outside its home country. And I suspect that once the developers understood that the symbol would be interpreted differently from the way that they intended outside their own country, they stopped using it. The symbol's not seen in other Zelda titles, even those featuring dungeons with clear Buddhist inspirations. Let's get to the dungeon itself now. How do we even find it? The game offers no hint or direction. Discovery is purely made through exploration or perhaps breaking down and looking at that included map. Taking time to explore, however, isn't a bad idea. The Manji, in my opinion, is a significantly more difficult dungeon than the two that came before. It's a good idea for players to track down as many heart containers as they can. There are five heart containers hidden on the overworld. Three are accessible prior to completing dungeons three and four. Two are hidden behind vulnerable walls, and the third behind a burnable tree. One vulnerable wall is located to the north of dungeon two in the desert area. The other is south on the seashore. The burnable tree is on the southern shores of the lake. Unlike later games in the series, however, these locations go completely unmarked. That means that there's no way to find them without a guide or just through trial and error. Players can eliminate some squares on the map. There will not be more than one secret per square. But honestly, I would just recommend consulting a walkthrough. I did on my first playthrough. I would also recommend that players engage in what may be the series' first formal side quest. Most of the side content in the original Legend of Zelda is comprised of optional items to find, such as the heart containers, but this one is different. If we're to use modern terminology, we might call it a fetch quest. Players start it by exiting level 2 to the south, then traveling east, then north three squares, following the path east towards the eastmost peninsula that we discussed in episode 2 of this podcast, Just before the peninsula, there is a long staircase leading to the north. Traveling up and entering a cave at the top will reveal an old man who gives the player a letter. This letter can be taken to an old woman in a cave just across the river on the western side of the map, near where players started the game. When presented with the letter, the woman will sell potions to the player. There's a red potion that costs 68 rupees for two servings, and a blue potion has only a single serving, but it costs only 40 rupees. When used, they will refill Link's hearts. I do recommend buying a potion to refill your health. 
I would also recommend finding and buying the blue ring. It costs a whopping 250 rupees, but it will reduce the amount of damage that Link takes. You can find the blue ring by traveling north from the potion shop and following the shoreline of the lake. Eventually, players will reach a dead end, guarded by living statues known as Armos. The Armos don't move until they are touched. Under one of these statues, you'll find a staircase leading to a shop containing the blue ring. Once purchased, Link's tunic turns blue, indicating that the damage he receives from enemies is reduced. Raising 250 rupees can be difficult in the original game and time-consuming, but players using a modern release on Virtual Console or Nintendo Switch's NES Online can make use of save states or a rewind feature to kind of spam the money-making game. Makes it easier to get the necessary rupees. I've found that this is the way I play nowadays. There's one other item I would recommend collecting before completing this dungeon, but the hint to find it is actually contained within the dungeon, so we will discuss it once we get inside. To reach the dungeon from where we found the blue ring, the player must travel south three screens, back to the potion shop, then west one screen, head south again one screen, and then west to reach the dungeon entrance. As a dungeon, the manji is fairly straightforward. Players are guided through the first three rooms with no options to deviate from the path. On the second room, the players will find a key guarded by large slime enemies called Zol. These will split into the smaller slime energies called Gels if it gets hit with the base sword from the start of the game. The key is out in the open, meaning players can grab it and continue north without having to defeat all the enemies. Another room, also filled with Zol, will have to be cleared in order to reveal a key. Heading north, players will meet their first room with a forked in the path. They will also meet a new enemy called a Dark Nut. These armored knights can only be damaged from the rear. They move erratically and are among the most difficult enemies in the game. Defeating three Dark Nuts in this room will grant the player bombs. From here, players have a choice to head either north or west. I went to the west. In the room to the west, players will find spike traps and the compass. A door to the north leads to a dead end, so we continue west. Players will find a room guarded by five Dark Nuts. All five must be defeated in order to open a door to the south. Traveling south, players will find a room guarded by eight Dark Nuts with a set of stairs on the eastern side. We can simply avoid these ones and go straight down to enter a two-dimensional room. This is identical to the room in level one where we found the bow, but in place of the bow there is a raft. This item will not be used in the dungeon, but is essential for reaching the next one. Heading back the way we came, players will go north until they reach a third room and battle a couple of Zoles, three Keys, all while avoiding enemies called Bubbles to acquire a key. The Bubbles will prevent Link from using his sword if he gets hit. Heading east, players will take a path through a room that is previously a dead end. Passing through a locked door, players will reach a room guarded by three Zol with a key. The northern arm of the Manji is entirely optional, but there is a clue on this path that we will discuss. Traveling north, players will find a room with spike traps and two Zol. After defeating them, they can push a block, just as in level 1, to open a door. Inside the door, players will find an old man who asks, Did you get the sword from the old man at the top of the waterfall? On the overworld, players must follow the river, going around the lake, and continuing to follow the river until they reach a waterfall. A staircase runs parallel to the waterfall. At the top of the stairs is a spring, guarded by one of the toughest enemies in the game, a Lionel. Avoiding this enemy, players can head into a cave where they will meet an old man who grants them a more powerful sword. This sword will defeat enemies like Azul in a single hit. It will also allow players to dispatch other enemies faster. My first time playing through the game, I left the Manji after getting this hit to get the better sword. I found it essential to beat the dungeon, and on replays I always get the sword before entering level 3. Back in the dungeon, players can acquire another key if they travel west of the old man, but that room is entirely optional and can be skipped. We can now head into the eastern arm of the Manji. There we'll find a room guarded by Zol and spike traps with the dungeon map, and we'll have to fight our way through some dark nuts, keys, and avoid some bubbles in order to reach the boss, Manhandla. Manhandla is a four-headed plant monster that glides across the room. It shoots out a steady stream of fireballs. Players can take out each head in turn, and the boss will move faster every time it loses a head. Or Manhandla can be defeated in a single hit with a well-placed bomb. Once the boss falls, the players can get another heart container and the piece of the Triforce in the next room. Mm -hmm. 
Next week, we're going to head to the center of the lake to explore the fourth dungeon in the game, the snake. I'm Paul Riley. Thanks for listening.